morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences of ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another educative session for you. The speaker for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Norihiro Sakai. Professor Sakai is the chief anesthesiologist and staff physician of the intensive care unit at the Daiyukai General Hospital, Aichi, Japan. He is a board certified member of the Japan Intensive Care Society and also the Japan Society of Regional Anesthesia. He holds a diploma from the European Society of Regional Anesthesia as well. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars and today we will be talking about regional anesthesia and neurosurgery. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Xiaolin Shen. Professor Shen is the Chief Physician at the Department of Neurosurgery, Beijing Tiantan Hospital, Capital Medical University, China. His clinical interests are focused upon cerebrovascular neurosurgery and he has published several manuscripts in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely honored and thankful to him for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars and today we will be talking about hemodynamic evaluation of cerebral AVMs. The chair for the first session of today is our distinguished guest from the United Kingdom, Dr. Vidya Nagarekhanam. Dr. Vidya is a consultant in anesthesia at the St. Mary's and Charing Cross Hospital, Imperial College Healthcare, NHS Trust. She has completed advanced training in neuroanesthesia and neurocritical care. She is also a keen medical educator involving in raising the standards for training for junior doctors as well as allied healthcare professionals. We are extremely grateful to her for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Dr. Norihiro Sakai. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest again from China, Professor Shubin. Professor Shubin is the professor consultant in neurosurgery at the Huashan Hospital, Pudan University, Shanghai, China. His clinical interests are focused on cerebrovascular neurosurgery and he holds the largest number of bypass for Moya Moya in the whole world. Professor Shubin is also the vice president of the ACNS and he is an active propagator of the online neurosurgery education for the benefit of young neurosurgeons. He has been the backbone of ACNS webinars ever since its inception. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Xiaolin Shen. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of the Yokokado, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. Dr. Libun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Dr. Vidya Nagaratnam. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everyone who's joined us for our session today. I hope that we will all learn something useful that we can take away into our clinical practice. Um, it is widely known that it is uh, not entirely possible to do most neurosurgical procedures under just the regional anesthetic technique. But a good neuroanesthetist and neurosurgeon does need to be able to understand the complexities and the fallacies of not using any regional anesthesia for our surgical procedures. Everything from an awake craniotomy to a transphenoidal hyposectomy requires some form of neuroanesthesia plus regional anesthesia as well. It is widely accepted among the neurosurgical community, uh, community that the people that described a scalp block technique was actually Cushing and Criley in 1900s, where they talked about bilateral blockade of the trigeminal nerves, which are both sensory and motor nerve endings that uh, facilitate do, to be able to take off the cranium without actually causing a painful sensation, particularly because the cerebrum and the cerebellum itself are insensate. Besides having regional technique of like scalp box, we're also going to learn from Professor Sakai today about the importance of things like Morphat solution or a cocaine based solution for um, endonasal topical anesthesia and regional anesthesia to facilitate a pituitary approach um, from a nasal passage rather than having a bifrontal craniotomy. We should also be able to appreciate how regional anesthesia in terms of epidural anesthesia and uh, spinal anesthesia, particularly with using derivatives like ketamine and morphine, can help with intraspinal um, segments that are being operated upon. There are many tumors that release lots of vasoactive substances that can cause um, localized inflammation as well as localized pain pathway activations. And it is very important that we consider how we can obtend those reflexes to ensure that the patient has got a post-operative pain-free cause that will enable early mobilization, particularly after spinal surgery. Professor Sakai is going to take us through his extensive experience from his center in Japan, where they do multiple complex techniques that require close working between the neuroanesthetists and the neurosurgeons. 
So, Professor Sakai, without any further ado, please let us have the words of your wisdom. Hi, thank you so far for, for my introduction and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to the Honorable ACNS webinars. Today, I will talk about the regional anesthesia for the neurosurgery. I am an anesthesiologist and uh, usually provide a general anesthesia for the neurosurgery, but today I will present the efficacy and the technique for regional anesthesia with neurosurgery. But today's technique and the method is a very, very easy and very simple for the beginners. Uh, so uh, could you please uh, uh, listen to the very easily? Now, <clears throat> the history of the regional anesthesia is very long for human beings. And the tradition, uh, tradition has survived from ancient time in the Inca Empire of South America that coca leaves were chewed to heal the, and perform the low puncture. And it's the eye broke by Carl Kohler, uh, Uslia. Sorry, uh, not Australian, but the uh, Austrian also from in 1884 that is reported to have been blocked and operated on the purpose of clearly using the local anesthetic effect to perform surgery. He utilized the local anesthetic effect of, of cocaine, which was considered clinically useful at that time to perform a block for eye surgery and succeeded. <clears throat> And one year after the William Hofstede in the United States, one of the four founding professors of the Johns Hopkins University and produced an actuary plexus block for upper arm surgery and local infusion techniques with cocaine. He cre uh, created and uh, coming up the bracelet plexus block after noticing an effect of eye block with, uh, by the Karkora. He tested the efficacy of the cocaine by himself and he was addicted to the cocaine, but he survived and he established a wonderful achievement as a surgeon. Uh, you know the Halstead uh, method of, of breast, uh, breast surgery and the Halstead who gave the first emergency blood transfusion in the United States. And uh, Hulst also Halstead uh, started the practice of the performing surgery in the sterile environment and the clear clean surgical ground and the clear gloves. And the Hussey Williams Cussing, a pioneer of a neurosurgeon and the US senior, was a student of the hosted. So I will talk about the management of the regional anesthesia for craniotomy, including a wake craniotomy procedure. Recent anesthesia journals notified the current opinion for much modern analgesia method for craniotomy. Much modern analgesia technique uh, means the pharmacological method of pain management, which combines various group of medications for pain relief. The most commonly combined medical groups, including local anesthetics, opiate, NSAID, paracetamol, and alpha-2 agonist. You must know when the complete analgesia for craniotomy, low dose opiate is insufficient and we must recognize the combination of non-opiate analgesics, if, uh, especially paracetamol, gabapentin, and uh, dexamethasone have a good evidence. And the scalp block, including local infusion analgesia, provided uh, excellent analgesia. Recent article added the review of the regional anesthesia for craniotomy, which presented the efficacy of the local anesthesia for neurosurgery. We usually use especially low pipacane and label pipacane for regional anesthesia because they, uh, these are much longer duration compared with the lidocaine. And uh, much safer than the bupibacaine. Bupibacaine has a slight much frequent, uh, frequent to uh, critical symptoms when occurs local anesthesia toxicity. Scalp block and the, the, these local infiltration analgesia shows the uh, improvement of the pain intensity and uh, early recovery. Of course, we cannot provide the heterocranial blockade of, of the dura because a small amount of local, uh, local anesthesia uh, induction to dura will cause a neurological depression and uh, conversion during surgery because of the local anesthesia toxicity. The other article also shows the importance of the uh, efficacy for craniotomy with local anesthesia. 
patients usually feel very strong uh, pain during the after surgery because of the strong intensity, but some patients never see painful. In other words, pain intensity have a larger range for each patient. However, uh, almost all patients do not feel the strong pain after the proper local anesthesia, and this will induce the reduction of the pain intensity, opioid some consumption, and the prevention of chronic pain. So, I will show you the procedure of the scalp block for neurosurgery. We need some nerves for scalp incision. The most important procedure is as for auricular temporal nerve block, zygomatic or temporal nerve block, and uh, uh, supraorbital nerve block, supratrochanter nerve block, and the greater hospital nerve, and the lesser hospital nerve block. Uh, these are many, many procedures that have but uh, very easy. These nerves are covering the sensation of the scalp. When we block these nerves properly, patient will feel almost no pain. We usually inject local anesthesia with the blind technique. Simple infiltration is very, very useful and very easy. But now, today, anatomical structure, we will show you uh, the anatomical structure, which is very easily visualized by ultrasound machine. <clears throat> now, the superorbital nerve is one of the two branches of the frontal nerve. Uh, it's itself a branch of the orthotramic uh, nerve. The other br branch of the frontal nerve is a supertrochanter nerve. Nerve structure itself is uh, very, very difficult to, to visualize, but the superorbital nerve foramen and the uh, superorbital artery is very easy to find. Uh, injecting local anesthesia into the superorbital nerve foramen, and then this spread around the superorbital artery, the nerve is completely. The superotrochanter nerve block is also very easy. The nerve is running major air of the superorbital nerve, so we must inject below the major eyeballs for only two or three millimeter of local anesthesia. The block is perfect. One more. The auricular temporal nerve is a branch of the mandibular nerve that runs with the superficial temporal artery and vein and uh, provides sensory innovation to the uh, various regions of the side of the head. Auricular temporal nerve is a minute, very, very small nerve, but less respectively easy to visualize by the ultrasound machine. The auricular temporal nerve is bracket 1.5 centimeter anterior to the ear at the level of the tragus. We can see the superficial temporal artery and the nerve structure near the artery when the ultrasound probe is fitting on the anterior area of the ear. We usually inject the needle was inserted anterior to the tragus, uh, posterior to the temporal artery, uh, which we use the uh, outer plane technique and the ultrasound guided technique. The reason of the outer plane approach is uh, uh, that the superficial temporal artery is a uh, needle trajectory or, uh, sorry, trajectory of the in-plane procedure during the uh, auricular temporal nerve block. Or more, the zygomatic temporal nerve, uh, as called the uh, zygomatic temporal branch of the temporal branch, is a small nerve of the face. It is uh, delivered, uh, delivered from the zygomatic nerve, branch of the maxillary nerve, and uh, it is distributed to the skin uh, of the side of the forehead. It communicates with the facial nerve and with the auricular temporal branch and the mandibular nerve. Zygomatic temporal nerve is also very small nerve. We can't, uh, we can't identify with the sound imaging. However, you know the nerve is running near the lateral end of the eyelid and local infiltration around there is a very, very effectively broken. When usually ultrasound guidance, uh, local anesthesia injection into the temporal fascia is a very good and easy technique. You can find the deep temporal artery and uh, you must not inject uh, into the artery. Greater, oh sorry, uh, greater ostial and uh, lesser spectral, greater auricular nerve 
originates from the vertebral and the uh, dorsal lami or the C2 and the C3 spinal nerve. The greater hospital nerve travel up to the vertex and the less hospital nerve innervates skin behind the ear. Greater hospital nerve supplies sensation of the scalp at the top of the head, over the ear and the, over the uh, protruded ground. The greater hospital nerve is easily identified by ultrasound imaging when touching the ultrasound probe posterior and the medial to the ear and the transverse view of the identified. The greater hospital nerve is uh, supply, uh, superficial to the abricular capillaries inferior muscle. The relationship of the greater hospital nerve to this muscle appear constant and reliable. The ultrasound transducer is moved down over the atlas to the location of the spinous process of the C2. The probe is then moved laterally to identify the oblique capillary inferior muscle of the neck. The goal of the ultrasound guided technique of superficial cervical plexus block, uh, which is mainly not a uh, uh, scalp block, but uh, uh, I will introduce now. And the, the nerve block is a deposit local anesthetics within the vicinity of the uh, sensory branch of the nerve root C2, C3, and uh, C4. The superficial cervical plexus uh, nerve block resulting in an anesthesia of the skin of the anterior lateral neck and the anteroarticular and retroarticular areas as well as the skin overlying the immediately inferior to the clavicle on the chest wall. The mental, uh, infraorbital, and the superorbital nerve are branches of the trigeminal nerve and not blocked with the cervical plexus block. The image of the transverse view of the cervical plexus. The branches of the cervical plexus are seen superficial to the uh, uh, prevertebral fascia. Uh, which covers the uh, middle and anterior scalene muscle and posterior to the sternocleidal muscle muscle. White arrow, this are, uh, sorry. Oh, uh, white arrow means the in uh, the first year of deep cervical first year. And the uh, PHN means the uh, phrenic nerve. So uh, when you inject a layer of the cervical plexus, especially below the first year of the deep cervical first year, you can complete the cervical plexus work. But medially uh, near the plexus, phrenic nerve is running down and too much amount of the local anesthesia will induce the phrenic nerve palsy. So I usually inject the lateral end of the sternocleidal muscle muscle. This area is very safe and apart from the phrenic nerve. So the past report argues that uh, maxillary block provides uh, sufficient pain relief or for scalp incision of the cranial joint. Z uh, they administer the mixture of lidocaine and budibacaine, uh, the total amount of the 10 milliliters and injected in the maxillary block. The most of the distal nerve innervating the scalp is all from the uh, obstetramic nerve and the mandibular nerve, while the maxillary nerve gives uh, effective scalp block for post repetitive 10, 10 uh, 11 hours. So I think that they are provided a mastery block in the proximal area near the ganglion. When injecting into maxillary block, the local anesthesia will spread proximally and also blocks the main lesion of the trigeminal nerve. Then the blockade of the obstetramic nerve and the mandibular nerve is successful due to the good spread of the local anesthesia by a simple maxillary block. The article provides interesting information about the learning curve about the anesthesia management and the scalp block for awake craniotomy. This study researched the trainees that they must acquire the essential method for the safe management of awake craniotomy. That is as follows, hemodynamic stability, proper sedations, regional anesthesia, and so on. The 
attendant anesthetist and the training anesthetist then self-estimated the ability of the anesthesia management with a self-estimate procedure. So scalp block would be acquired within 10 procedures, but sedation and the intraoperative hemodynamic uh, management is much harder to get as the service. In other words, uh, small expense is enough to complete the technique of lesion anesthesia with scalp block. That is to say, uh, I can say that simple local infiltration anesthesia with low dose, uh, low pivacaine, the butyvacaine is sufficient. That is a very easy, and you can try it tomorrow. Now, the next frame is the lesion anesthesia for carotid endarctectomy uh, as called the CEA. Uh, this is a very careful picture, and uh, listen to retrospective data analysis. Uh, reveals the performance of the CEA and the cases are based on carotid artery stenting. We call CEA, CES or the CAS of the carotid artery diseases. The study argued that the post outcome, including stroke, acute myocardial ischemia and death after 30 days or on the, after five years are comparable between these two procedures. So CEA and CAS produces a excellent outcomes after carotid artery stenosis. So today my institution pro, uh, produces a CAS CAS for almost all patients uh, with carotid artery stenosis and uh, I have never experienced the CEA for several years. However, many institutions in many countries, CEA is now still a major surgery for carotid stenosis. Now when the surgeons and the anesthetists manage safely for the, this surgery, which is more preferable than an anesthesia or the lesion anesthesia. <clears throat> in our institution, CAS is uh, provided under lesion anesthesia and the surgeon and the patient uh, communicate to each other, but on CA, which is a good choice. <clears throat> the surgeons recommending the general anesthesia argues the reasons and that a patient can receive the proper antiperitative therapy and patient and can accept easily. And when we need the intraluminal shunt during surgery, they can produce easily under general anesthesia, which is a very difficult to use in the original anesthesia. However, uh, we have evidence that the uh, CEA affected the cognitive function uh, post-repeatedly, especially in elderly patient. Uh, however, 25% of the patient have a cognitive deficit of the CEA. So under regional anesthesia, we have a good monitoring of our brain and the cognitive function during surgery. Also, some institution is still disabled to use and access the electrophysiological monitoring when using under lesion anesthesia. We can always uh, and continuously monitor the brain function easily and rapidly. Wait a moment, sorry. <clears throat> The March Center trial shows the GARA study, which is a very, very famous study, and uh, which is a uh, uh, comparison of the general anesthesia and the regional anesthesia for carotid artery surgery, mainly for CEA. The primary outcome is the proportion of the patient with stroke, myocardial infarction, or the death within 30 days. The risk relation, uh, risk relation was, uh, uh, sorry, the risk rate is uh, uh, 0 0.94, which means the general anesthesia and the regional anesthesia is uh, comparable for the occurrence of the postoperative cardiac and the stroke-like event. This means that the safety management during surgery is properly provided to, to patient. The anesthesia method is known as the main factor of the risky outcome occurrence. Which method is better depending on the uh, some extent on the patient's general condition at the time of the surgery. And uh, the patient wishes and the accessibility of the monitoring at each facilities, uh, as well as the ease of the management by the surgeon and anesthetist. Regional anesthesia have the benefit for monitoring cerebral perfusions and have a disadvantage or pain and anxiety. So the reasonable approach, and I recommend it that the CEA is mainly performed with a regional anesthesia, not alone, but then uh, we use a mild sedation or the appropriate general anesthesia that does not require the excessive sedation and analgesia. And now 
Uh, again, I will talk about the uh, introduction, uh, introduce the proper regional anesthesia for the CEA, which is, of course, the local infusion analgesia is uh, very effective. But the superficial cervical plexus block uh, already introduced is a very good indication for CEA. The cervical plexus is arising from the vertebral lamy of the C1 to C4. Deep branch has mutual innovation, and the superficial branch is uh, mainly relating the sensory. The block is a very easy to administer. Uh, only injecting the local anesthesia into the lower layer of the cerebral muscle to muscle and the above the major scan muscle. And we recommend it to use uh, the administration amount to the local anesthesia as uh, uh, three to five milliliter of the 0.75 low pipacane or the 0.5% level of pipacane. It is uh, sufficient to manage the pain. The first research is uh, comparing the efficacy and the preference of the regional anesthesia or the general anesthesia for CEA. The retrospective research added that the surgeon and anesthesiologist was preferring to use general anesthesia for patients who were young age, Hispanic efficacy, uh, BMI under 18.5 uh, and uh, dyspronia chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and smoking. And the preferred regional anesthesia is low hematocrit and low platelet. This data shows that the anesthesia procedure had never provided the mortality difference. And uh, if you avoid the perioperative transfusions or perioperative pneumonia, the data indicates the sub effect was much lower regional anesthesia. Regional anesthesia is uh, uh, not only safe and effects for risk patient, um, but it seems to be useful for our household and uh, for redux, re reducing the consumption in the state budget. And the medical cost is lower in the regional anesthesia. The difference is on about 3,000 US dollar, which is very, very high. And the uh, ICU administration rate is very low. These data indicate the most cost effective with regional anesthesia. So the expert regional anesthesia provider and the safety management professional recommending the following opinions. And that is considering the uh, potential of the uncontrollable airway, patient anxiety, discomfort, and the stress during surgery. Of course, general anesthesia is far more likely to use currently. The key factor for uh, improving surgical outcomes is collective perioperative team experience and the routine in place. Once more, I must say opinion, regional anesthesia combined with general anesthesia is a beneficial for patient and the medical staffs. I understand that this opinion is a very safe answer and that this is a very typical for the high achieved owners. And uh, however, I think it is better for me to express this opinion in a public webinar like this. <clears throat> and the last, uh, I will talk about the home take home message, uh, which is also I would like to give you the owner response. But then, uh, regional anesthesia is a very uh, good alternative for pain management during craniotomy and keratito and adrectomy. Regional anesthesia have the uh, good potential for reducing the complications, medical costs, and the burden of the medical institutions. And the ultrasound imaging clarifies the anatomical nerve causes. Okay, so uh, in the end, I will talk about the introduction of my hometown. Uh, my hometown, uh, Aichi, is a very famous industrial city in my home country. And uh, especially, uh, especially my home surround, Aichi Prefecture is the largest region in Japan in terms of the board value and the volume of the industry shipment. The Japanese one of the largest industry company is a Toyota. And the Aichi Prefecture has the headquarters of the Toyota. And uh, Toyota is a very famous automobile, uh, example, Land Cruiser and the uh, Evil Prius. But then Toyota has originated in the fiber textile industry. The company's beginners were the manufacturing the old, uh, automotive rooms. Uh, even today, the textile industry and the automotive, uh, automatic rooms and the manufacturing is one of the major industries. And my city, Ichinomiya, 
uh, is a very near from the Nagoya city, the capital of the Aichi prefecture. It's a one of the most historical for textile industry in Japan. And uh, much of the values of the textile in Japan is uh, still going uh, from Ichinomiya city. Thank you for my, uh, listening. Okay, thank you very much for that very informative talk. I'm sure we all have learned a little bit there, and hopefully that will enable us to have better neuroanesthesia practices to help our neurosurgeons provide best care for patients. Thank you very much for joining us again today. Thank you so much. Are there any questions that our allied panelists would like to interact with, Dr. Sakai or Dr. Vidya? Professor Shubin, any comments from you? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I always use uh, general anesthesia, so in my uh, personal experience, so I don't have any question for this topic. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you. <laughs> I, I would like to tell, um, maybe others could learn from my experience. So at Imperial College, we tend to do 50% of our craniotomies no, I'd say about 30% of our craniotomies are our weak craniotomies. So they all have a ultrasound guided scalp lock um, pertaining to the five nerves that Dr. Sakai has talked about. After the scalp block has been given, we do run a dexitonomy infusion as well, intraoperatively. And um, we used to do the awake, asleep, awake method where we did a general anesthesia, they put the frame on and then we take the frame off and then uh, we make sure they're fully awake. But we found that for fine motor skills and the eloquent speech areas, giving them even a short general anesthetic can have detrimental effects on intraoperative monitoring. So we have moved away from that technique. For the last five years, we do a regional technique followed by IV dexitomidine. Also, okay. the other topic I was going to comment upon is that Giving a scalp block is uh, very easy to learn. And uh, with the advent of using ultrasound technique, most yeah. of my registrars are able to do a scalp block with between 20 and 25 mils of yeah. liver yeah. Um, which is our preferred uh, choice that we have. We don't have ropivacaine in London, but I have mm -hmm. heard that you can get equally good um, scalp blocks with ropivacaine uh -huh. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, Dr. Sakai, is that yeah. uh, your use of uh, regional techniques in multiple points for reducing post-operative pain is very important for, yeah. for neurological recovery, because it yeah. means in the recovery room, you can very quickly test and make yeah. sure that there is no adverse events. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. Does anyone have any questions for us? We have Ben from Hong Kong. Hello, Ben. Would you like to? Yeah, ask hello, something? hello, Raja. Yes, I have a question, and uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. So, yeah. can I ask uh, uh, in your center for uh, the awake craniotomy, uh, if you consider using the the uh, the regional block, uh, uh, how uh, can you uh, show uh, share with us your the dosage with, uh, regime for your um, uh, injection? Do you use a liver uh, perpetual king? And usually, how much uh, would you distribute to uh, each mm -hmm. nerve? Because uh, there are so many um, uh, puncture sites. Uh, you you might have several targets to block. Uh, uh, another thing uh, uh, is that um, uh, in your uh, in the awake craniotomy of your center, do you? Um, uh, have an experience of a um, uh, have any experience in comparing those uh, with a general uh, uh, sleep awake and sleep and also the completely um, awake um, craniotomy? Okay, uh, in my institution, uh, we have no experience about the awake craniotomy because of the uh, neurosurgeons. But uh, uh, plus, uh, I worked in the university uh, university hospital. I pr uh, produced the uh, awake craniotomy region anesthesia only, and uh, my sedation during surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, I usually use uh, 0. Uh, 0. 75 percent lopivacaine mixed with uh, uh, lidocaine, uh, including uh, adrenaline. 
adrenaline, adrenaline including uh, lidocaine and uh, combined with uh, 0.75 percent lobivacaine is uh, using to the amounts or is there uh, um, 20 to 30 milliliter of the uh, local infiltration algesia not using ultrasonamacin because uh, uh, in in this year in this terms uh, we have no um, not so many uh, ultrasound machines is for the mm. uh, neurosurgery. Uh, almost all the uh, ultrasound machines are using for the uh, orthopedic surgery and so on. So uh, we usually use um, brain technique for the local infiltration, agesia, and the lesion scalpel block for the abic craniotomy, but the bit is very eff uh, efficient and uh, uh, we can provide a very good analgesia during the surgery and the patient do not feel not, not so very strong pain, but uh, uh, usually use uh, small amounts of the opiate or the mild sedation. It is a very, very uh, useful or the, uh, it is very important to use during surgery uh, for the awake craniotomy. Uh, when you use, uh, uh, when we use uh, 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 normal uh, craniotomy with a general anesthesia. We usually use um, 20 milliliter of the lopivacaine uh, simply uh, to the uh, injecting yeah. as a local infiltration anesthesia. Thank you. Yeah, uh, similar to us. And uh, I, I can also ask uh, in your center, uh, is the, <laughs> those uh, regional block is uh, done by a neurosurgeon or you have, uh, or or anesthesia, or you 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 might have a uh, pain team uh, which comprise of a, a little surgeon or anesthesia. Which one? Mm -hmm. Which one is the situation in your institute? Uh, also, in in my institution, almost all the surgery is uh, injecting the local anesthesia by the neurosurgeons, not to use uh, by the an uh, anesthesiologist. But the uh, very young patient or mm -hmm. the very uh, um, I think that we must think about this patient will uh, argue the very strong pain uh, or the, the patient is under uh, 40 or 30 years, very young. So mm -hmm. we, uh, you, you usually provide your local inflation anesthesia or the scrap block for patient uh, former to the, uh, in the, uh, when the, the uh, induction of the anesthesia uh, after the anesthesia induction, but uh, uh, before starting the surgery, because uh, many neurosurgeon is uh, completely uh, forgetting to use uh, local anesthesia after surgery for the mm -hmm. pain management, uh, be, be, uh, because uh, neurosurgeon is uh, uh, almost the, all the neurosurgeon is uh, very very busy and they're very uh, tired after surgery yeah so and i usually use uh, look on the <laughs> cd yeah, thank you thank you so much yeah thank, thank you, you very much yes, any yes. questions thank you. my thank you co-host so libun saying any questions from me yeah thanks thanks raja thanks prof for a very uh, interesting uh, topic i just have uh, uh, two questions uh, regarding uh, uh scar block uh, for yeah. awake anatomy uh may yeah. i know that uh how long does it uh, work and uh, what are the monitoring that you have uh, to, mm -hmm. to see that whether you need to give additional injection or whatsoever, or tell the surgeon that no, no more effect, I need to convert to uh, GA mm -hmm. or whatsoever. Can, can I have a bit of explanation? Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think the, uh, the duration or the how long it, uh, the lobby backing or the local anesthesia is effective is, it is a very difficult question for me because uh, and the, uh, the amount of the local anesthesia or the mixture of the local anesthesia and the, the patient situation, almost many, many factors is uh, existing. So the, the duration itself is a very difficult, but uh, my experience, simply my experience is uh, over uh, seven to eight hours of the surgery is uh, uh, tolerable for the patient, and uh, almost all the patients do not uh, complain uh, the very strong pain during surgery for the awake craniotomy. And uh, when uh, we, our institution, uh, do not use uh, uh, awake craniotomy, but uh, almost all the patient, uh, when the surgery is over for eight or to ten year, uh, ten hours, but uh, almost all patients do not 
comprises a very strong pain in the intensive care unit. And uh, I do not use uh, many amounts of the OPH, only a few amount. So the 20 milliliter of the lopivacaine is, I think they are sufficient to use for the scalpel block. And uh, too many uh, uh, administrator of the, uh, administration of the uh, local anesthesia is very, uh, very dangerous for the patient uh, with uh, local, local anesthesia toxicity, I think. So I do not use uh, too much amount of the ropibacaine, okay? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. We had a wonderful discussion and we're extremely thankful for that valuable information. With that, we'll close the thank you very much, first uh, session. Thank you. And I would like to thank both the chair, Professor Vidya Nagaratnam and the speaker, Professor Nori Sakai for this wonderful session. We'll move on to the second session, and I would like to invite Professor Shubin to say the introduction and invite Professor Xiaoling Shen. Okay. Uh, Professor Sh uh, Chen Xiaoling comes from uh, Tiantan Hospital, uh, which is the biggest one in uh, north part of China. Uh, the similar size uh, with our Huashan Hospital. So, also maybe 16,000 surgery per year, this size. Uh, Chen, uh, Professor Chen, uh, he is uh, uh, working with uh, Professor Wang Shuo and uh, uh, Zhao Jizong, and uh, they did a lot of uh, series of AVM resection. So now uh, let's uh, give the time to Chen Xiaoling. He will introduce uh, AVM hemodynamic changes. Let's welcome. Good morning, and know that in China that would be say good, good, good evening. And so today is my topic is about the hemodynamic evaluation of uh, cerebral arterial venous malformations. I come from uh, Beijing Tiantan Hospital and Department of Surgeon, and just as the professor she have introduction in, have introduced to my hospital, and. Every year in my hospital, uh, in my department, the resection, the number of the AVM resection to be about uh, 150 to 200 cases per year. Um, but today I just want to introduce or uh, share some experience of some research about the hemodynamic evaluation of the AVMs. And as you know, the definition for the AVMs that is the uh, uh, feeding artery directly to the drilling vein uh, with the needles. So that means that there's uh, two parts for the AVMs. One is the fistula between the feeding artery and drilling vein, and the other slash would be uh, should be some needles. So that means the hemodynamic is very important for the development and the growth and the rupture of the AVMs. So look at the slides. There's a traditional multimodal image evaluation system for pre AVMs. From the left side, you can see the CT scan. The basic CT scan, we can see some lesion of hemorrhage from the CT scan. And from the MRI scan, we can see the bottom of the AVMs. And from the SWI series, we can see the hemosidary. And from the DSA, we can get the dynamic uh, dynamic uh, uh, series uh, for the feeding artery, nitros, and drilling vein. And also we now have the DTI. We can set, we can set the functional MRI with the DTI and see the uh, fiber uh, re reconstruction. And also we have the ASL and we have double volume fusion. And also we have the eye flow. Eye flow, that means the the eye flow is the color coding angiography. That is the uh, main topic that today I want to introduce the, to, to you. And also during the operations, we have the intraoperation evaluation, we have the navigation, we have EEG, we have ultrasonic, and we also, also we have some flow cells for, to evaluate the hemodynamic. So uh, this now in my department, there is a, there's a Phi platform for evaluate the BAVM uh, for the hemodynamic. 
And that is the, the top one is the color coding angiography. We call the color coding DSA iFlow. And also with the second the CFD and with a an, uh, serial the physical model and flow to 800, let's say yellow, uh, yellow flow cells and intra operate the intra, uh, intravascular pressures measurements. So it's the platform, plat one. Hold on. Uh, plat one, that is the color coding, uh, color coding uh, angiography, uh, DSA. So what is the, what is the color coding, color coding angiography? Oh, see, so for this platform, use the color coding angiography, we focus in our team, I focus on the rupture and treatment. And you know, the there's two presentation, why the rupture and why the seizures for the PAVM. And in my research, we focus on rupture and the, there's the three parts of the AVMs, feeding artery, nidos, and joint vein. So in our color coding angiography platform, we focus on nidos and also focus on the joint vein. Until now, we have published four uh, papers about the nidos, uh, about the focus on the nidos hemodynamic variation, and two uh, paper about the joint vein. For the treatment, we use the uh, this. Uh, this platform to evaluate the uh, evaluate embolization uh, after the embolization, what uh, hemodynamic change for the AVMs. So, what is the color coding angiography? That we, as we know, the DSA is the gold standard. is the gold standard for all the uh, is the gold standard for the diagnosis of some vascular disease such as aneurysm AVMs because the DSA that can provide the anatomy image also with the hemodynamic information. So look at the picture of the up, that's the traditional DSA. Uh, usually we look at the DSA angiography, we will see the dynamic series because we, we need to see the feeding artery, the nidos, the joint vein, and we have to see the whole dynamic series. But for the color coding angiography, color coding that means use the different color to pre, pre uh, to that means the uh, different time, uh, different time for the uh, contrast arrives from the red to blue. If we see the red one, that means the the trend, the chance arrived first, and then from the red one to yellow to to green and to the blue, less the uh, that means the time uh, faster and the slower. Okay, so from this one picture, there is a, just a single one picture. We can see feeding artery. We can see the genital vein nidos, and also we can see the different color. From this different color, we can get some uh, quantitative parameters. Hold on. So Okay, so this is the first uh, paper I published in the stroke. The paper title is the higher flow is present in uh, in unruptured AVMs so with silence microbreeding. So as you know, the microbreeding we also call some hemosidery and microbreeding or micro micro hemorrhage AVMs that maybe is another important subtype of unblocked AVMs. That, uh, uh, this definition actually coming from our, uh, when we resection reset the AVMs, we need to find the border of the AVMs. And during the operations, there's some hemosidery between the normal tissue and the abnormal tissue, that is called hemosidery. So uh, we think maybe this kind of uh, hemosidery, some AVMs that is unruptured, but with hemosidery. So that we cause hemosidery positive. Maybe this kind of stator is a third stator between the R rupture and the rupture. So that's why we need, we make some research about the hemosidery. And this idea first coming from Michael Lawton and during the, his research, he tried to evaluate or try to see what is the reason, what is the uh, factor with the hemosidery. And 
So he found that good final MIS outcomes and better outcomes in hemosiderary positive group than in those with a frank rupture. So he support, he think the surgery for silent hemorrhage patients that would be the outcome would be better than the frank, uh, than the rupture one. <coughs> Uh, so in this panel study, at that time, I, I am the visitor scholar in USSF, and you know, an idea that came to me that is the what is the risk factor for the for the hemosiderary because there's a, the uh, uh, I think the hemodynamic factors is very important for the for the BAVM. So I use the this the color coding angiography and to see is there any hemodynamic parameters is different between the hemosiderary uh, positive group and the hemosiderary negative group. So there's the flow chart from the UCS the brand AVM uh, study database and also with the UCSF neuropathology AVM database. And when we, we need to get the DSA available and also we need the arm blood AVMs and also we I exclude uh, uh, small AVMs, and because this uh, angio uh, color coding angiography is more sensitive for the superior tentary AVMs, so finally we get 25 cases. The 25 cases were divided into two groups. One group is unbrachial AVMs to with, uh, without, without simosidary, that we call simosidary negative, number is 16. And the other group is unbrachial AVMs with simosidary positive, the number is nine. So we use this uh, color coding angiography. This color coding angiography is a uh, software come from the Siemens. And after the, the we get the 2D angiography from Siemens, this iFlow, this uh, post-procedure software that can be used to reconstruct color coding angiography. And we also can get the time density curve. See this time density curve. And when we put the ROI into the different, uh, into the vessels, each vessels or each ROA, ROI, we can get one curve. Look at this picture. We put our eye on the feeding artery, so we get this the time is the uh, time density curve from the feeding uh, feeding artery. And if we put the our eye on the journey vein, there's another curve we can get. And between these two curves, the time between the these two veins peak, the time between these artery and the vein, we can get the parameters, mean chance of time. And also from the zero to peak, the time between the zero and peak, we can get the time to peak. So this is the main two parameters that we can get from this color coding angiography. And for this panel study, finally, we get the feeding artery, the time to peak of feeding artery was longer and time to peak uh, genital veins were short in the simosidary uh, positive group. And the more important is that we get the mean chance of time through the needles is shorter in, in hemosidary positive group. That means the, the time between the needles is faster, less, uh, is faster than the uh, simosidary negative group. So we get the conclusions to hemodynamic parameters shorter mean chance time and lower ratio of DV time to peak to feed artery time to peak were associated with the presence of simosidary. And simosidary was not associated with any patient and geographic characteristics except for a venous variants. And these results are consistent with our hypothesis is that faster flow through the avian needles associated with the hemosidary. So another, another conclusion is that this kind of color coding angiography can provide an objective hemodynamic evaluation in a clinical setting and may be a practical means of setting future hemorrhage risk in arbitrary AVMs. So this is my first paper about the uh, color coding angiography clinical application. And the other paper is that we also used uh, this kind of platform to focus on the needles to see what is the rupture, uh, what is the risk of rupture with the hemodynamic factors. <clears throat> 
So we uh, we use the time density curve fitting process and calculate the quantitative hemodynamic parameters. So from this another project, we see you can see this curve. That's the curve from the we can see the curve is. This one is the inflow gradient, and the other is the outflow gradient. And from this new curve, we get the more get the more parameters. That one is the stasis index. That means the inflow gradient divided by outflow gradient. That means the, the flow uh, the flow inflow is the is is more than the outflow. Or is the speed is the flow is the speed is faster in the inflow, but the outflow the the speed is slower. Okay, so for this project, I put the ROI, one is the uh, ICA, and the other, I put the ROI on the feeding artery, and oh no, our, this, the ROI, I put on the uh, needles. <coughs> and here we have the hemodynamic, pre hemodynamic predicts of VAVM ruptures. One is the stasis index. Stasis index, that means just as I just as I said, inflow that is more, but the outflow is too slower. That means the more blood in the needles. Okay, so that's the higher stasis index. And also we get another parameter that is a slower transnidals relative velocity. That means the velocity in the needles is slower. That means the more blood uh, was, was crowded in the in the needles. So that caused uh, these two uh, parameters are significantly correlated with the BAVM rupture. Yeah. So we also use the uh, stat statistics to finally to get the results. Higher stasis index and slower TRV in Q DSA were effective predictors of future hemorrhage. Yeah, that's the same conclusion. So that means the suggestion that the core mechanism underlying AVM rupture should be intravascular blood stasis and a crucible the hyperemia of the needles. Maybe this true mechanism for the rupture AVMs. And then the nanosurgery re research we focus on uh, needles. Now, this the topic of the, the, this uh, uh, study is the reduction in brain parasites are associated with BAVMs instabilities. For this project, I want to compare the uh, the unruptured BAVM with the control and also the uh, unruptured cases that is the hemosiderate positive group and the other hemosiderate negative group. But this, uh, well, this target is focused on the parasites. As you know, the parasites is one of the important parts for the BBB. And, and uh, finally, we get the results and the microbreeding was negative correlated with parasite coverage. Because from this, uh, from this basic research, we can stand the parasites number and the parasites coverage. And then they, finally, we get the microbreeding is, uh, is, is, is more severe with, uh, if the parasites is lesser and if the parasite coverage is, is, is small, though the microbreeding will be bigger. So that means the, the decrease of parasites was positively correlated with the mean chance time of avian nitos. <clears throat> yes, so that's the uh, conclusion, just what, as I said. And so for, from the, uh, the first the three papers, we, we used the eye color coding angiography focus on the nitos. Now we, Move the move the ROI to the drainage vein. I think maybe the drainage vein is another important important risk factor for the research. Uh, it's very important uh, factors that we need to focus on. So this is another uh, papers that we delay the venous delay the venous drainage in rupture AVMs based on quantitative color coding angiography. <coughs> so from this project. C, A, and C, there is the rupture cases, and C is our rupture cases. 
A and C, we put the ROI on two. One is the ICA, the other is the jungle event. So from the uh, from the ICA minus to jungle event, we can we call it that is the the whole the the whole hemisphere circulation time. And from the B and D, we put the ROI on the ICA and on the the second one in the feeding artery, the third one on the drainage vein, and the first one, the final one, we put on the drainage vein to the sinus. So we put the ROI on four parts of this, um, of the IVM. And from this one, rupture cases and non rupture cases. And finally, we get the, the hemisphere circulation time is longer in rupture cases. And also from the drainage vein to sinus and to ICA to sinus, it is shorter in the rupture cases. <clears throat> so that means the prolonged drainage time from vein to sinus was associated with BMA rupture. Also the hemisphere, the circulation time of rupture BMA is longer. Okay. And, and this one is the, another project that we, we try to figure out the small size, if the small size is associated with the rupture status. Because we all know from the clinical experience, we get some ideas about the small size is more rupture, is easier to rupture. But what is the, what is the mechanism or what is the risk about the small IVMs that the more rupture is prompt to rupture than, than the larger one. So for this, the pro, this project about when to figure out that. <clears throat> and for this one, you know, uh, first uh, we compare the two group of rupture and our rupture and the small needles is one parameters. And first uh, we get the small needles is a weak factor for rupture. Yeah, the first we get it, small needles. And another one, then we compare if the small one and large one in the different parameters is the diff is if the difference between the small one and large one. And the finally we get the if the small nitrous group was more likely to have hemorrhage predictors such as lower outflow gradient and higher stasis index of the main genetic vein. That means that means. Outflow gradient lower, that means the more blood would be uh, in the needles. And also higher stasis index of the main genetic man. That's so the same mechanism for why the small one have the have more rupture. So these two cases presentation. This is the small needles of rupture and see the curve, low outflow gradient. This one is the outflow gradient. And this one is the large needles out rupture and see the out, out gradient. This out gradient is steep, is steeper than the, than the smaller one. That means the flow from, from these unruptured cases, the flow would be out flow, out flow from the needles will be quickly. And from this small needles rupture, the blood will be, would be would be more have would be more time or would be more in the needles and the outflow gradient is is not so steeper. Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, there's the we use this panel study just to evaluate that small AVMs is a significantly higher uh, rupture than the larger one and underlying cause may be due to the specific hemodynamics. Okay. And also another paper is that we, we try to figure out the, if we use the partial embryization, what would happen for the hemodynamic? So we use this color coding angiography to evaluate what happened after the partial embryization of the AVM. Now we put our eye in two, in also the, the four parts, ICA and the joint vein, see the joint vein and the joint vein, a uh, feeding artery during the vein and the sinus. This is the four ROI. And first, we compare the, the patient. If the patient pre embryation and post embryation, the hemodynamic, hemodynamic parameters, if 
if the hemodynamic parameter will be different. So the results it shows that post post embryization, most of the hemodynamic parameter will be changed. And the second time, the second project, the second um, uh, the, the 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 second aims we just want to compare the if the embryogenesis is less than fifty percent compared with the embryogenesis less uh, more than fifty percent. So what is the difference between these two parts between these two procedures? And for this one, uh, yeah. For group one and group two, group one is the less than 50% and group two is more than 50%. And if the degree of the embryogenesis is more than 50%, the hemodynamic changes are more severe, most of which are manifest in various the mean chance of time. That means the different uh, the time between the ICA to feeding artery or ICA to joint event or joint event to sinus, the time between the, the different uh, ROI that would be more severe, severest uh, in the in the embryogenesis more than fifty percent, <clears throat> and also we compare group one and group two, and that uh, is the same. That means the mean chance of time, the larger the embryogenesis volume, the greater the change of hemodynamic parameters. So we get a conclusion. Embryogenesis can significantly change the hemodynamics of AVMs, especially in patients embryized more than 50%. And from hemodynamic per, per, uh, perspective, partial embryogenesis can prolong the mean chance time of the night dose, which may mean the partial embryogenesis can reduce the risk of AVM rupture. And okay, so the another platform is the CFD. Actually, the CFD, most of the CFD was used to, to evaluate the hemodynamic of any region. And some there, there's not so many uh, research focus on the uh, AVMs because the you know the NITOS or the AVMs is very complex. It's very difficult to use the CFD. Pro platform. And in our project, we use CFD, focus on the joint event, because we cannot use CFD in the NITOS. The NITOS, the, the blood in the NITOS is too complex. <coughs> so we, we use the CFD on the feeding artery and joint event. <coughs> and there's a, a panel study, uh, seven cases of rupture and six cases of rupture. And you can see the number of segment with high velocity and WSS in each segment, also in the rupture, and WSS um, maximal in each patient is higher in the rupture, and also pressure in the in the rupture case is higher. <coughs> so we get the WSS and pressure of joint vein uh, of war of rupture AVM were higher. Also, in the joint vein, rupture AVM case increased in uh, linearly, while the pressures in the joint vein of arm rupture AVMs decreased linearly. Okay, so see, uh, see these two curves. The, the, this curve is too steep, and the other curve is not so steep. And also, we use the CFD to compare the different part, different part of the joint vein, and we see the WSS in the posterior. Uh, during the vein of rupture AVMs was often ele elevated, which may be the reason why during the vein stenosis often occurs in the later segment. <coughs> yeah, and there's another platform. We used the theoretical physics model platform. And this, we, are, we because that's too complex for us for the AVMs, so the theory of the physical model we have to uh, have, have to suppose we have to have to, hypothesis that is very easy, very simple hemodynamic for AVMs. Then we, we suppose that one feeding artery and one joint vein with the nidos. <clears throat> okay. So, and the contrast, we use this kind of models, and the contrast agent, agent time density curve obtained by the physical model is highly consistent with the. Uh, with, with the 
DSA iFlow. That means that we use this serial model the same as that we get it from the color coding angiography. And this B is an independent predator of IVM ruptures, suggesting that the imbalance of inflow and outflow may be the internal mechanism of IVM rupture. Okay, because the, this paper, this paper is coming from another another corporation, and that is the Fernanda University, so they get they get me the results. Okay. The final platform that we used in our in our in our research team that we used the intraoperative intravascular pressure measurement. <clears throat> and the background in the previous study, pressures in the drainage vein was measured in oh in uh, six AVM animal models, and it was found that pressure in the drainage vein change significantly when the embryogenation volume is more than 50%. So in the previous study, some research, some authors used uh, in the animal model to, uh, to, to, to measure the pressures of the drainage vein and they get the panel results. And in our project, we also used the intraoperative monitor of pressure and we put these pressures in the different part we can we uh, we calculate we measure the different pressure, mean artery pressure and uh, feeding artery pressure and joint vein pressures, and also we can calculate the pressure gradient. Uh, PGY is MAP minus feeding artery pressure, and PU two is feeding artery pressure minus joint vein pressures. Okay, and there is the six cases. Three cases are rupture cases, and three is the rupture cases. For the uh, mean uh, pressure, uh, feeding artery pressure and drainage pressure is the, almost the same. But for the PG1 and PG2, PG1, that means the uh, uh, mean, mean pressure minus the feeding artery, and PG2 is the feeding artery pressure minus drainage band pressures. And more important and more in significant is the PG2, because you can see these uh, three numbers. Our rupture cases, the PG2 is smaller, is, 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 is smaller than, uh, than the rupture cases. That means the, that means the high pressure in feeding artery and, and larger pressure gradient, larger pressure gradient from feeding artery to drainage vein was significantly associated with avian rupture. But because this case is too small, just uh, six cases. So we just get some, I get some idea or get some impressions about this, this uh, results. So this is the summary of I, my team have already published the paper about the hemodynamic evaluation for AVMs. So there's a summary. The hemodynamic mechanism leading to AVM rupture is the blood pouring in the AVM region and the sharply decreased pressure gradient. And also the hemodynamics is an important factor leading to the clinical symptoms and progress of AVMs. And the establishment of a multi-dimension, multi-model and multi-platform hemodynamic evaluation system is conducive to the formulation of a more scientific and accurate clinical management plan for AVMs. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Shaolin. Okay, thank you, Professor Chen Xiaoling. <clears throat> he gave us a very fantastic uh, uh, presentation. And uh, uh, I, I think this is a quite new knowledge to most of the neurosurgeons. And uh, congratulations. Uh, my question is, uh, I noticed that some uh, ruptured aneurysm, you measure the, this kind of hemodynamic change at the subacute stage, which means uh, still have some hematoma there. So I think this kind of hematoma may be prolonged the, uh, make the curve more flat because after after the 
uh, hematoma totally absorbed, maybe maybe the curve can change again. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the timing is uh, is uh, a key. I think the timing when you when you should measure it is also a a question should be discussed. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Xu. Actually, for during my research, we have considered this, uh, this factor. Uh, so for these kind of cases that we exclude uh, acute, acute hemorrhage phase, because if the hematoma that maybe affect the, the curve, the intensity, the, we, you know, the acute phase will uh, influence, the, influence the hemodynamic status. Right, so uh, most of the cases that we used, uh, all the hematoma have already, have already disappeared. Then we put these cases into our res research. Yes. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. One question that I would like to put across to Professor Shen is that, uh, is in your practice at your institution, do you always embolize all the AVMs? or sometimes this was conducted only for research purpose. How is it in your place? Oh, you missed the embolization for the AVMs? Yes, is it all, is it that all cases under the embolization? Yes, yes. We, for this project, we used the, uh, uh, I, I want to compare the different partial, different rate of the embolization for the AVMs and to see what is the difference between this uh, uh, different embolization rate than the different part. So we can we divide it into two parts. One is the more than 50% of the embolization rate, and the other part, the other group is less than 50% of the, of the embolization rate. And actually, yes, uh, if the more, um, more and um, more than 50% of the embolization rate that have more serious hemodynamic change compared with the other group. Yeah, we get the result. Thank you very much. I understand Professor Shubin does not embolize AVM, is it Professor Shubin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, actually, <laughs> I, I doing both, you know, embolization and the reception all by myself. So uh, sometimes we, we combined with the <clears throat> embolization preoperatively with the resection. And uh, sometimes we only do the embolization. Uh, sometimes we can get the totally cured. And uh, if there's some remnant, we will do the gamma knife or cyber knife. Yeah. Yes, Ben, Ben wants to ask some question, Ben. Yeah, congratulations to your excellent results, uh, Professor Chen. And also, I would also like to thank Professor Xu for sharing this session. So uh, my question is a little bit practical because I'm very interested in your uh, CFD uh, uh, analysis. So may I ask in your center, uh, what software uh, do you use or, or is there any uh, uh, engineer to code uh, to write some codecs in, for example, in MATLAB or in, other situation and also uh, in your center, uh, what kind of a disease um, uh, would you use uh, the CFD, say, aneurysm, uh, OMOL, or any or after bypass surgery? Can can you share some uh, tips with me because I'm quite interested in this uh, aspect? Okay, okay, thank you for your questions. Actually, for the CFD, we this is a very panel study and we used to write the code. And for the ABM research, CFD is a very useful tool. We all know that it already can be it already be used for Myoma disease and for the aneurysm, especially for the aneurysm. And for the AVMs, that is very difficult to use to by the CFD. So that that's why we use the CFD for the target on the genesis vein and on the feeding artery. It's very difficult. It's maybe impossible to use the CFD focus on the nitrous. You know, it's very complex. Yeah. yeah, right, right. So that's why you used, okay. Another question is that actually in our department, the CFD is not be used in the clinical, but just for the research. Yeah, and most of the project focus on the aneurysm 
to see the arm rupture aneurysm and to the, and safety with the safety evaluation and to to follow up to see if any uh, arm rupture state change or something you know yeah so most of the research focus on safety the aneurysm. Mm -hmm. is, is in your center, uh, the, uh, your, your neurosurgical uh, trainee is doing the, the coding or you find another uh, person, for example, engineer or... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, actually there are some students to write the code for evaluated safety. I see, I see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so some much. Some PhD, yeah, PhD, guy, PhD guy to write the code to, to, to see. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested. <laughs> Just wanted to take a test. Maybe the mind. same. Because we think the new surgery is very busy and yeah. we, you know, we don't have time to, to, to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, same to me. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot make it myself, I think. <laughs> so so I think maybe you can use the that's why that's why I focus on the angiography, color coding angiography, because right. this software is you can use that. Because this, this software is already put on the Siemens angiography machine. So it will be easier to, to use. You don't need to write code. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we so. focus on the angi uh, color code angiography. <laughs> yeah, thank right. you. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, answer this question from Ben. Uh, the one software, if you ever go to Professor Kato's place in Japan, you will use the software Hemo, HemoFlow which is a commercially available for CFD. And uh, I, as a fellow, I have done hundreds of CFD using that platform at Professor Carter's place. It, it takes around 20 minutes. You have to take the CT angiogram. You have to cut the exact aneurysm inflow, outflow, and then you feed into the software and you will get all these parameters, the wall shear stress, the what is the pressure index inside the aneurysm, and everything you will get. I see. I see. Expensive I see. software. It is can I, can I, in Japan. Yeah, can I, can yeah, I get some emails later on? Actually, AVM, <laughs> AVM research uh, for CFD, maybe just as uh, Professor Chen mentioned, it's uh, too complicated. You know, actually, in my opinion, some, uh, especially in the ruptured uh, AVM, <clears throat> When you resect the AVM nidus, actually normally we can find some change, uh, especially some part of the uh, uh, vein can be occluded spontaneously, then cause the drain pattern changed, then cause the outflow uh, stenosis. So the prolonged, the uh, so-called uh, the poor, you, uh, Shaolin, you mean the, you mentioned it, uh, it's a, what kind of yeah, the outflow, it, outflow. Uh, yeah, outflow gradient, outflow yeah, gradient yeah, yeah. and inflow gradient. Yeah. So it, it's change, <laughs> it's always change. Yeah, and it's, it's some kind of, uh, you know, this is a not, not a uh, AVM, it's not a mechanical, uh, nidus. It's a uh, biological nidus, so it can be changed. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sometimes it's this kind of change make make the AVM rupture. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, I. Yes, procession, please. Oh yeah, I think that actually that's the limitations for all the research about the rupture and unrupture. If, if we can get the follow-up pro prospective uh, cohort uh, to follow up to see the arm rupture cases, the follow up until the rupture cases, that would be more you 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 mean that would be more ideal for this uh, for this model, yeah. But in the clinical research, it's very difficult to get that. So we have to compare the rupture cases with the arm rupture cases. Maybe there's some yes, that, that's the main limitations for the research. I think. Okay. Lou, any questions from you? Right, yeah. I think uh, Prof just explained because my concern is uh, in his study, it's all ruptured and the hemodynamic uh, parameter may change after rupture. So, uh, more importantly, for us to know 
what are the hemodynamic parameter just before rupture, I mean pending rupture. So that information are more accurate to reflect that what case will be uh, uh, impending rupture. So I think like Prof Chen have uh, said, uh, probably a prospective study uh, those who have measured and who we rupture in the future and those parameters are the most important to predict uh, which case need to be treated before it get ruptured. Uh, hopefully I can get comment from Professor Chen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I totally agree with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, two thank speakers, you. very fantastic presentation. And uh, tonight we have uh, uh, 1,222 audience watch the, your presentation. That's a quite a number. Thank you both. Well, thank you. Thank you very mm. much for that wonderful piece of information. Now it's time that I will close this webinar officially. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to thank both speakers of today, Dr. Norihiro Sakai and Dr. Charlene Shen, as well as the chairs, Professor Vidya Nagaratnam and Professor Shubin, for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And today, as he mentioned, we have around 1,200 people who joined us live. And also a special thanks to my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Sen, for joining me. So until we all meet on the 13th March, bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.